Yes, please feel free to take your seats. Thank you very much, Barbara und Musik. I have the pleasure to guide you through this evening tonight. My co-moderator that was announced from Nairobi, Ulf Talinten, unfortunately felt sick and will probably watch this on live stream. Best wishes to you, Ulf, and also a warm welcome to all the people who watch this on live stream from their homes and offices and I don't know where. This evening, Barbara said it, is about activism on the Horn of Africa, a region that has seen dramatic changes in the past two years. The YouTube pictures you saw earlier, we've been screening while you were coming in, took us back into the events, for instance, that led to the end of Omar al-Bashir's rule in Sudan. Ethiopia's reforms, however, started with the new prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, from within, and we might want to discuss this later. While Eritrea's dictator remains in power since 28 years. I'm glad and honored to welcome four young activists from the region, which I would like to very briefly introduce to you. Ala Saleh, to our right. With yeah, welcome, Ala. Thank you. Ala Saleh is a Sudanese student and activist. And as you see, she gained worldwide media attention due to a picture. We are showing this picture shortly now of her that went viral in April 2019. And I think this picture is familiar to all of us in the room. She is a member of Mansam, Women of Sudanese Civic and Political Groups, an alliance of political women's groups, civil society organizations, youth groups and individuals in Sudan that were active in the Sudanese revolution in 2018-19. Very welcome, Salah. Thank you for coming. And then also from Sudan, and right next to her is Moussa Baba, a journalist, activist, and co-director at Giza Group, which is an organization based in East Africa, specializing in media development and civic engagement. His work with Sudanese Archive, which I think was formed January 2019, Is that right, Musab? 2018 already, okay. The collective works in Sudan to monitor and curate visual documentation of human rights abuses and, as we've seen, pro-democracy protests. Thank you for coming, Musab. <laughs> From Ethiopia, we welcome Zemdena Abebe. She's a feminist activist and the founder of AfriColors, a social enterprise startup curating products made by African women. Considering herself a pan-Africanist womanist, she works to amplify the voices of women and to disrupt oppressive systems through her writing, storytelling, and activism. Zemdena has been the first female president of Addis Ababa University Students' Union, and I thought that was worthwhile mentioning. Welcome, Zemdena. Thank you for coming. And last, not least, on a bit of a shorter journey to us from Stuttgart to Berlin is Wayne Araya, who is a German Eritrean activist volunteering in working with refugees in the Stuttgart area. She's also a founding member of United for Eritrea, Barbara mentioned it, an alliance of young people connecting globally with organizations, in initiatives and alliances Seeking democratic change in Eritrea. Welcome, Wayne. So, just to say quickly that we have several languages at stake, and Allah will, uh, has chosen to speak in Arabic. Therefore, I also say hello to Nadim Jazzy, who will be helping out in uh, consecutively uh, translating. Allah tonight. And then we have English and German translation, so use the earphones uh, and get them quickly if you don't have them at, at place. Let us start talking about Sudan. The pictures took us, us right in, in the scene. Allah, as we said, you became the icon of the Sudanese resistance ever since you stood on that car 
and kept singing while protesters were chanting with you. You yourself once said in an interview I saw that you are only one of a million of courageous demonstrators demanding freedom and peace and justice. Can you tell us a little bit about what personally brought you to the protests, what made you an activist? في البداية برحب بالحضور سعيدة جدا إن أكون جزء من الحدث ده وإن أكون في Allah is always very fast and very passionate, so we always have to slow her down a little bit. Welcome. I would like to say hello uh, to you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm quite happy that uh, I can be here. I usually start with commemorating the martyrs of the Sudanese revolution. Without them, this threshold of democracy would be unthinkable. Without them, I would not be here. Democracy is like um, a gift, so to speak, and uh, this is why I would, or a dough rather, and this is why I would like to commemorate it today. I usually say that I'm one of thousands who took to the streets and who simply followed the call for freedom in Sudan in order to reach freedom eventually. Well, my personal motivation was, or is, to exp I'd like to explain it as follows. Either you stay at home and you die under the regime or in the system, or you take to the streets um, with the possibility of dying immediately, but uh, you also have the chance to eventually live with dignity. Well, we believed in the revolution and we also wanted to give a sacrifice for our home country and so we believed in our victory. We didn't know when we would win but we believed in it and we still believe in it. Well, I would like to emphasize that uh, there, we have a regime with 30 years of corruption that uh, we could want to do away with. We said enough is enough. And it was um, necessary to cause change. And we want to live in a Sudan that we were dreaming of. And we wanted to um, achieve a change. Well, we were able to achieve change because we were able to
to create a unity, a unity in our belief, in the belief in change and liberation, and of course our love to our home country was also part of our motivation. I think you said it very clearly. There was there was that feeling either you you stay and die at home, as you said, or you go out. Uh, Sudan has seen protests before 2018, uh, also inspired by the Arab revolutions and uh, in earlier days. And still, end of 2018, there was a, as if there was a new era. Um, can you? Elaborate a little bit on, on, on this point. How did mobilization take place? To what extent did the protest eventually, you know, mobilize masses to an extent that the protest became a revolution? Um, and yeah, in what way did mobilization take place differently from before? Or was it just that more people lost the fear and went out in masses? How do you explain? حقيقة الثورة بدايتها كانت عشر دي البداية الفعلية بالنسبة للعالم إنه شافها. Well, the date is actually end of December 2018. That's when it started, and it was actually a, an accumulation of past demonstrations that took place in 1989. It was an accumulation of individual or fighting of collective fightings, also political problems, and all this basically was the motivation for all this. Well, the to 2013, uh, the demonstrations in 2013, is that between 2013 and 2018, I mean, we were lacking the consciousness for raising demands, uh, actually. In 2013, we did not fail. It was a good experience, and we could build on that so that we could learn in 2018 and, and modify our actions. But there were many crises. I mean, there were economic problems, also political problems. There were also social problems. And also in our daily lives, we faced many problems. So everything started on December the 19th, when the National Congress of the uh, regime's party um, came together. And then suddenly there was this spark nationwide, where people realized that this is the time actually to start revolution. Well, first of all, we started with protests and protest marches, and in particular in Khartoum, and uh, one district is called Arab Quarter, or Arab Market, rather.
and the disadvantage was that we didn't get any protection there. So the infrastructure there does not provide any protection. This is why we went to the peripheries of the town. So it always started at 1 p.m. every Thursday nationwide in Sudan. And from then onwards, the marches went towards Khartoum. مسابق بكل اساليب القمع والضرب والضرب الرصاص الحي وضرب القاز المسيل للدموع والاحتقالات. But despite the peaceful character of the protests or the marches, we were deliberately and arbitrarily attacked with tear gas and also um, we were also beaten and shot at. Some people lost their eyes because of the tear gas and uh, were injured. And also the arbitrary uh, detentions were horrible without any legal justification. People were detained. So this was very brutal. Many people were killed and we lost many uh, people in the streets. And we realized that the regime is afraid of us because they were fighting against us in such a brutal way. So it was quite clear for us we can now achieve change because the regime is afraid of us, so we are strong. When you went out of your house and uh, went to the demonstration, of course, you could say, well, I might not come back. But we accepted that. We accepted the possibility of dying because Sudan deserves better than the uh, situation at the time. The revolution uh, went on December, January, February, March, till April. And on April the 6th, this was a turning point in the revolution. On that day, many things changed in Sudan. The demonstrations um, have the motto, million minus one equals zero. So this means that they actually wanted to reach all the people. They wanted the support of every single individual. So that everyone sees that um, they ha have an individual responsibility um, for the revolution and also to support the revolution. So uh, I forgot something, so now I'm going to add that. On April the 6th, the protests took place before the military headquarters in Khartoum. And we went there from three different quarters. So we went to the military headquarters on that day.
and we knew quite clear, clearly that the military forces actually wanted to um, crack down on us brutally, but we weren't afraid and we made this day a good day, a great day. On 1 p.m. everything started and we ignored the military activities. We just had one objective. We said we are on the right track and we will continue. So in front of the military headquarters, we had uh, Little Sudan, so to speak. So all the demonstrators came from different provinces uh, from Sudan and from the north, from the west, from the east. And everyone was there gathering together. And the protests took place up until June. So we can basically say that the protests in front of the military headquarters were actually the best days of Sudan. And I think these were also the best days for the Sudanese people. On June the 3rd, these protests were clamped down brutally. So there was a massacre on June the 3rd and many people were killed. And of course we do not, did not only want uh, al-Bashir to resign, we also want to topple the whole regime. So not only Omar al-Bashir, the whole system, we wanted to topple the whole corrupt system. So in a way, it took us right into it. Uh, well, I, I get the impression when you speak that one, one gets a, an almost, almost a feeling of, of what took place. Thank you very much for that. I want to bring in Musab with a, with a question on something that I think Allah has just uh, explained so well, um, which is the context in Sudan. It's highly militarized, as Allah was pointing out with many examples, and activists have been subjected to unspeakable violence, the, the peak of which was the massacre in, in Khartoum, obviously. In this context, I want to ask you how you explain how it became possible for people to place their faith in a nonviolent struggle, in disobedience, in, in a movement that was not uh, using any forms of violence. And don't you think this seemed at that time up against all odds? I mean, it was such a strong oppression, repression, as Allah vividly pointed out. Um, thank you, Heinrich Boll, uh, for having us here. Um, and as Allah stated, the struggle in Sudan has been an accumulation of many struggles. Uh, like you said, it's a very militarized environment. Uh, those of you who are old enough will remember, as long as you can remember, you've heard about civil wars in Sudan. Uh, you know, the rebellion in the South started before the independence in 1955. You went from that time, it's been on and off civil wars, uh, but there's been a common pattern of trying to remove the repression that's coming from the center 
of the state. The problem, uh, you know, John Garang used to always say that there's no problem in South Sudan. It's a it's a Khartoum problem, meaning that it's the successive governments that have come to power in Khartoum have always had some form of militarization against marginalized groups. So from South Sudan, then you had the war move into Nuba Mountains, into Blue Nile. Then in 2003, you had the Darfur War. Uh, the response of the government has always been the same, has always been to a counterinsurgency uh, campaign, which has been to arm tribes to fight other tribes. Uh, this slowly started creating uh, discontent around Sudan. Uh, however, there's always, in parallel, there's always there's been an armed struggle, but in parallel, there's always been a very strong civil nonviolent resistance to these governments. You know, uh, Sudanese overthrew dictators in 1964 and then again in 1985. Uh, these have kind of been the accumulations of the parallels. You know, the, there's a very racist uh, policy that the government usually tries to separate between those of the kind of more indigenous uh, groups and some of the more northern groups to kind of create that divide and use, they've tried different things over the years. You know, there's the underlying kind of, you know, ethnic uh, struggle, but there's also the religious part of it. You know, uh, the jihad that was declared on people in the South, it was actually, you know, conducted by the state itself. So these accumulations they started leading to breaking points, you know, throughout the Bashir regime since 1989, even, you know, the political parties that are part of the freedom and change right now were at some point uh, leading an armed struggle in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, 2013 was kind of a, a breaking point. Uh, you've had uh, uh, the kind of peak of the armed struggle against the government uh, that was in the form of the Sudan Revolutionary Front. And this had armed fighters from all around the marginalized areas, from Darfur, from Nuba Mountains, from Blue Nile. But at the same time, then you had it coupled with the biggest protest that Sudanese have seen since independence in 2013. Uh, Alaa said something interesting earlier that it, when the authorities use that level of violence against protesters, it's almost like the protesters now smell blood. They see the weakness of the government. If you have to uh, use tactics, that the same tactics that you were using uh, against armed combatants and come and use it against protesters, people started understanding that this is pretty strong. When you fast forward to December 2018, Something happened that's never happened in the history of Sudan. You know, you had protests spark in Damazin, which is in Blue Nile, southeastern Sudan, on the borders with Ethiopia. It moved to Abbara, then it moved to Al Fashir in Darfur, and then it moved to Khartoum. But by the time it went to Khartoum, then you had, for the first time in Sudan's history, people from all the way from South Kordofan to the north, to the east, to the west, all going out to the streets. Not only that, but the leaders of the armed movements themselves, they not only backed the protests, but they re-emphasized the nonviolent nature of the protests, saying that basically we picked up arms because we had to defend ourselves. But the winning strategy of removing this government has to be through nonviolent means, and it has to be a mass movement. Because with the nonviolence, you can actually involve much more people than you would in an armed struggle. That kind of gave confidence not only to people in the center, but it gave confidence to people in the marginalized areas to start actually using these tactics, to go on marches, to speak up, to use media, to use petitions, to be very specific about, we need this government gone. So the nonviolent tactic was kind of the apex of all of the accumulated Sudanese struggles you know, from independence uh, and it worked. Well. I wanted to ask you, speaking about the margins, or uh, with Sudan, we often say peripheries. Um, you you mentioned when we talked about your motivation to to become an activist yourself that what inspired you most were were the the resistance of communities in in these margins. Uh, can you give us some examples? I mean, we've seen a film out there which is in a very uh, 
rather remote area uh, of these rebel puppeteers, as you call the, the film, being very brave in using puppets, uh, showcasing this brutality of Omar Bashir and so on and so on. Give us examples that inspired you as an activist. Well, with the conflict zones in Sudan, uh, these are generations that have seen violence from the central state. Uh, so you go to these areas and you see that, you know, teenagers, their parents and their grandparents have seen military onslaughts uh, from the government. Despite that, not only uh, were they able to organize politically, you know, not only just a, a violent reaction to violence uh, being perpetrated on them, but they were able to organize politically and able to see that not everyone in the North was their enemy, that there's a government structure and there's a actual system and there's a regime that has different institutions and things like that, but also kind of using culture and using the social ties as a form of resistance. Uh, so for example, you know, uh, in the Nuba mountains, you know, you have people in the Nuba mountains that look at events such as wrestling and such as musical festivals as a way to mend social ties with their neighbors. You know, they might have neighbors from different ethnic groups, but they would also do these exchange visits and use these cultures to actually, you know, mend the social fabric, but also as a way of to kind of stay alive and remember why they're uh, struggling. Uh, this also coupled with the fact of these are become closed areas. You know, if you go to Jabal Murra today in Darfur, you see that the people over there have, have had an onslaught on them for such a long time, but they were able to not only survive, they were able to feed themselves, they were able to, you know, create kind of a social fabric uh, over there, but they were also able to express themselves as far as, you know, uh, we want Bashir gone and its system gone, but we call on all Sudanese around to uh, resist the system. Thank you. Very impressive, actually, what, what, what you're telling us. I'm sure there's many more examples of that out in the country. It, it, Sudan always appears to me as being very complex, so I'm always grateful when somebody manages to, to, to explain the, the complexity well. Um, I, I wanted to briefly uh, just talk about the current situation, which is still very volatile. And, and if you can maybe just highlight uh, briefly what is the main challenges ahead. We have a transition government now, which is, which is there for three years, still uh, the old uh, forces, some of the cronies of the old regime hold a lot of power next to the civilian rule that was put in place. So just briefly, what is the main challenges I had for you in Sudan before we go to the other countries? Um, the number one challenge is the challenge of militarization itself. You know, we're not talking about, you know, uh, an organized military that's ruling the country, but we're talking about a large number of militias. Uh, some of them have been formalized and legitimized uh, not only by the government, but by the international community. Uh, the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, is pretty much the main challenge uh, right now because this is a militia that's grown and become legitimized and now more or less runs the country from a political perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Uh, not complete control, of course, but calling the shots on kind of the, some of the more, uh, you know, aspects of the country that actually matter uh, a lot. Uh, for example, you know, these militias control a large sector of the mining, a uh, large section of the mining sector. Uh, you know, gold has kind of been the, become the number one export of Sudan after the South separated. Uh, so when you have a militia like that controlling a large section of the mining sector, the number one export, it becomes a problem because now this militia can pay for itself. You know, and these, the leaders of these militia have actually said that we don't need the government's money. We have our own money, you know, uh, as if that would be something good, uh, you know, to save money for the government. But in reality, it's pretty uh, scary. Uh, a, a lot of the challenges have to do with not only the militias, but the war economy itself. How much is going towards the security apparatus, towards the military, towards these militias. Because under that, then that, you know, go, 
that branches out into different problems. You know, you have, you know, we have a website uh, called Ayn Network, and we cover a lot of the, uh, you know, movements of militias and the conflict dynamics. Uh, so we were looking at the uh, search results uh, or the search terms that lead to our websites. And the, one of the main search terms was RSF jobs, you know. So it's actually young people without a job looking for a job with the rapid support forces because they pay well and, you know. So the, these are the kind of challenges, you know. Most of the cannon fodder for all of these wars has been youth. So one of the biggest challenges is how do you create options for youth so that they're not driven towards uh, militarization. Yeah, I wanted to ask that is, is the second challenge there for putting putting youth into jobs and, and, and earning bread. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to thanks a lot to both of you. And we will get back to Sudan when we open up for questions, I'm sure. But I would like to talk a little bit about, since we're talking about the region, we picked three countries at least of the region. So let's talk about Ethiopia. Zemdena, Ethiopia has seen a quite different development as I've said in the, in the beginning, with reforms um, being pursued within government and the dominant party, which was also ruling for long. How do you read what has happened since Ethiopia's new prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, is in power? What's your reading of how could it happen? How did this appear? And what does it bring you? Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, so the reforms in Ethiopia was as shocking to me and Ethiopians as it was shocking to the rest of the world. It was totally unexpected. Um, after 27 years of dictatorship, um, after 27 years of not, be ab not being able to breathe, being stifled, to, have, uh, to come here in Berlin and talk about Ethiopian politics is a big deal. Um, of course, the reform comes with its own challenges. Ethiopia is a very complex society. Um, we have ethnic groups with different ethnic interests. Um, and I think it's posing a great deal of challenge for the current government too. Uh, we're very polarized. I don't think we have a common agenda. Um, although I really welcome the reforms by Abiy Ahmed, particularly pertaining to women. Um, uh, next to Rwanda, we are a country that has uh, made the uh, gender parity. We have women in parliament. We have the first women president, which is a big deal. Um, I thought I was going to be the first prime minister, but um, I'll still get there. Still to come, I'm sure. Yes, because the president is only nominal, and the, the most powerful is the, the prime minister. So I still got my chance. Um, yeah, so uh, there are changes in the upper strata of government, but has it really trickled down to us, the society, especially for me as a radical feminist and being from a country where you're told to be silent, where you're told to be um, not only silent as a woman, but as a society. They say there's also a phrase, um, I don't know if I can translate it, it's like, it's better to be quiet than make noise. Um, because when you're quiet, at least you don't die. But it's not true, because our silence was killing us. The fact that we did not speak. Either ways, like Allah said, whether you speak or not, if you're going to die, you're going to die, right? But it's better to speak and die, because at least there will be somebody else that will follow your dreams. So um, in terms of what Abiy Ahmed has been able to do, yes, there are changes on the upper government level, but I'm, I'm a feminist. And although I wanted to be the prime minister, I kind of changed my mind later on because I don't think changes come from governments. So I am part of the civil society. I'm part of the activist group. I think that's where the real change is. So um, I'm still debating whether or not I want to be the, president, the prime minister, but then governments are good, they're necessary, but they need to be pushed. So if we don't push them, and then it's not a favor, like there's this assumption that what Abiy Ahmed did for Ethiopia is a favor. I don't think it's a favor. I think he's doing what he's supposed to do. And I think he needs to do more. It's not enough. Like uh, when I walk on the streets, I don't feel safe. I still get sexually harassed. Um, okay, having a woman president is good, but what does it mean for the everyday women of Ethiopia? 
Has that been able to be translated? Also our economy, what are the changes? We're like, in terms of internally displaced people, we've become the highest since Abiy Ahmed assumed power. So what does that mean for us, the people? Um, I'm impressed with the changes, but I think there needs to be a lot of push still, and that's what we're pushing for. So now that you decided that you stay with civil society for a while, uh, we are quite curious to learn from you what made you a feminist activist in the first place. Uh, Raising your voice, you said, as a need, but what makes one an activist? It takes a lot in Ethiopia. Yes, it takes a lot. Sometimes I wish, like, why can't I be like everybody else? But, but um, for me, it's more of like a natural tendency too. Like I think activists feel things more than the general public. Um, so for me, what made me an activist is uh, it's out of necessity. I wish I didn't have to scream. I wish I didn't have to be angry all the time. I wish I didn't have to like, you know, um, be at the risk of death every single day. I wish I could live like everybody else, but you can't because... The situation around me forces, it necessitates it. I became an activist because I want to live free. Like when I walk on the street, I don't want any man, you know, cat calling me, harassing me. Or when I, I, when I travel to different countries being considered like a criminal, like being stripped, searched, I don't want that. Like I'm a full human being and recognizing my full humanity makes me an activist. It makes me voice my um, opinions and then demand what is rightfully mine. So um, it's a situation around me, it's not easy, but if the world was a better place, I don't think activists will exist. I'll, I would have been an artist, right? Like, and I look like an artist, right? More than an activist. <laughs> yeah, so. So Dana, that makes three options already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, wanna, I wanna continue a little bit on this line. Uh, there was reforms on the top uh, with, with, uh, with the prime minister, uh, Uh, announcing that there should be more women uh, ministers, uh, the first president, as you said. And also, uh, we all remember that he gave this initial speech mentioning his mother, which was never heard of in Ethiopia before. I mean, one doesn't praise one's mother uh, for, for being such a great woman as he did. Um, so, so he did quite a lot from the top. And yet, um, you live in a country... Uh, where gender justice seems a long way to be achieved with uh, patriarchy being the social norm. So do you feel that a gender revolution is on its way? And, and in what way? How? Um, I don't think the women's question as a question, you know, women are a group of people, right? A community. I don't think it has been asked in the Ethiopian context. Of course, uh, sometimes it could also be derailing when you have women as, you know, um, they, they could be used as filling numbers. So you'll just say, oh, I'm a country that has been able to put women up there. And then you forget the real people down. So I don't think the women's question as a question has been asked because women are very political groups. And I don't think we've been able to do that. There are movements that are um, emerging in Ethiopia that outright call themselves feminists. So to call yourself a feminist and an activist in Ethiopia is like a taboo word. Um, it's considered like, uh, oh, those people that talk on TV, oh, those people that are creating problems. Because whenever activists, you know, agitate and disrupt systems, everybody's not happy. So we're seen as the enemy. In some countries, ac activists are supported. We don't get a lot of support in Ethiopia. We're considered, we're equally hated as the government. So it, it becomes a challenge to convince people and say, we're really with you. We're not, we're agitating for change and that changes for everyone. So women assuming power and um, disrupting systems, we, we're a long, long way to go. But I think we're on the start because there are, there's a feminist group called Setawit. It means of women in Ethiopia. It's the first feminist organization in Ethiopia because the others hide under women's organization. It's safer. When you're a feminist, you're considered like, oh, you hate men, like... Uh, I mean, I don't hate men, but like I hate patriarchy because patriarchy is a system. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Thank you. So, and would you say that while well, you say I hate patriarchy, there is a connection to democracy? Absolutely, because um, actually, like the way I understand democracy is a rule of men as we understand it now. 
if we go if you go to like germany okay germany might be you guys have a chancellor that's good right but a lot of politics <laughs> yes a lot of politics is uh, still dominated by men political sphere space is assumed to be the birthright of men but it's our rights like that's why i'm conflicted still like maybe i should be the first prime minister to prove to people that we can be prime ministers we can be leaders leadership is not reserved for men so patriarchy is a, is it's a system and then democracy is also a system of men as 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 the world is now not by definition but in reality democracy is just a group of men leading the world and i think that's why the world is not where we want it to be if there are more women included in the system it will be better for all of us not just for women for society collectively so are you are you actually saying that are you saying with all due criticism <laughs> Uh, what Dabir did was putting putting women up in these positions and therefore really sending a strong sign to women in the country that they could assume power in their daily lives, uh, go to school, resist early marriage, or resist violence, and and so on. Is there is this sign felt in the population? It's absolutely felt because earlier you mentioned that he talked about his mother. And it's very, by the way, it's very common for Ethiopian men to press their mothers, but it's just extended to, extended to their mothers. Apart from their mothers or sisters, any other women is not a human enough. So Abi Hamid, in terms of politics, I think he's a complex figure and I don't want to take away the things he did because they're very essential and important. But then again, I don't think that uh, political leadership in the upper um, hierarchy of government is, is really transforming women. Because sometimes, like even to, to be part of that club, you have to follow his policies. If you don't agree with him, he gets offended. Like, you know what I mean? It's a one-man show. Like... Um, Like I said earlier, he's not doing us a favor. He's doing what he's supposed to do. And then to, to join that group, group, you have to follow his policies. And I don't think that's what feminism is about and uh, what uh, the world we envision is about. So still a lot to do for civil society organizations, individual activists, I assume. You, you call yourself quite uh, strongly a pan-Africanist, uh, pan-African Womanist, uh, can you explain a little bit what is the practical reality of pan-Africanism for activists pushing for wider civic space? Uh, yeah, uh, the reason I call myself a pan-Africanist is because I think the future of Africa depends on the unity of Africa. Um, I think uh, we have emerging um, interests from everywhere and if we're supposed to survive this new wave of Chinese interest or global interest, I think Africa needs to be a strong force. But that is on the political aspect, right? For me, Pan-Africanism is also about like social unity, social cohesion, like the, the unity of the people of Africa, understanding that we have a common goal and that we want to reach uh, our common goal together. So Pan-Africanism for me, in terms of that is... Um, That also, but the Pan-African leaders or how Pan-African started is also patriarchal. So I struggle with that as a feminist. So for me, the, the way I try to marry the two is by uh, being a Pan-African womanist. What it means is, um, as also feminists, we're usually criticized for being for bringing a concept that is from outside Western concept. So when I say my, I'm a pan-Africanist womanist, I'm recognizing the labors of my grandmothers who allowed me to speak up, to be myself. Like when I see Allah, like I'm so impressed. Like you see, like, although you don't understand Arabic, like you see the fire, you know what I mean? That is feminism in real life for you. So that's what my pan-Africanism is. My pan-Africanism recognizes the intellectual labor of Africans, the knowledge produced by Africans, and then also the fact that Africans are the solutions to African problems. Thank you very much. I think we will get back to this issue uh, at a later stage, but I also want to talk a little bit with Wayne about Eritrea. Uh, und ich spreche Wayne auf Deutsch an. Uh, also vielleicht 
Now I'll be addressing Veni uh, uh, in German. So if you don't understand German, please use uh, your headsets. Eritrea is suffering from a dictatorship. Isaiah um, Aporeke for 28 years now. Um, there is no legislator. There is no independent civil society organizations, no independent media, no independent uh, uh, judicature. Um, in Eritrea, um, uh, you have to, uh, you are drafted, uh, which is basically um, forced labor. Uh, People uh, uh, um, try to leave the country, 12%, uh, presumably it's more, uh, have already fled Eritrea. Uh, and exile communities are growing. You were born in Germany. And, uh, and Zimbema uh, said it, uh, you had this, uh, uh, she, 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 wi she wishes, or she wished to have this, this uh, unencumbered life, uh, but, but uh, you could have. Uh, had this uh, uh, easy life, yeah, but, but why did you why did you choose to become activist? Well, I I was born in Germany. My father was ELF uh, a, a fighter, so we fled to uh, Germany when I was when then they were young. And uh, the, my father always told me about uh, the front. Uh, he always told me war stories. And uh, as a kid, uh, I, w I was very impressed. I also wanted to become a, a soldier and wanted to fight for Eritrea. And uh, I recall very well in uh, 1989, I told I said to my father. Uh, the Isaias, you don't know uh, from this guy from the other part, uh, uh, who's a general, uh, and what he, uh, but I never forgot, uh, my father told me in 98, uh, this guy uh, is, uh, uh, is coming uh, uh, to power, Eritrea will uh, live through something that it has never uh, lived through, uh, worse than colonization, and uh, what my father said uh, materialized, it was worse than anything that Eritrea lived to before. I have the privilege of being born in Germany, I was, uh, but I, I wouldn't fight for Eritrea. I would do something uh, else uh, in terms of uh, activists. Uh, uh, as, a, as a small a kid, I was inspired by Mother Teresa, who <laughs> she was in those, those refugee camps, and, and uh, I need to use my privilege, I thought, uh, for my sisters, uh, for my uh, people that has been so pressed for, for hundreds of years. Colonialism, then uh, this Ethiopian suppression, 30 years, independence war, and now 28 years of an unelected uh, 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 government that was a transitional government and still is in power today and uh, spreads horror um, and give, it takes away, and, and people, uh, uh, as soon as they get a possibility to leave the country, they leave the country, and that uh, makes me so sad. And so I feel a responsibility, because I grew up here in Germany to fight against this injustice in, in the home of my parents. So activism in diaspora. I wanted to learn more from you what that actually means, because uh, we heard from the others uh, about the activism in their in the streets of their home countries. You are here. Uh, you are in other European countries. Uh, so what's the challenge from a diaspora to claim a democratic change? Are there opportunities? Is there a chance? for uh, uh, connecting with the people within Eritrea. Uh, currently, it's better. There's been an opposition movement since the 1980s. Uh, Eritrean people uh, joined forces and associations and political parties uh, united for Eritrea. has been on for now nine years before that. Uh, I was with my uh, father in the in that political party, and uh, it was difficult as a young uh, woman to grow up here 
Uh, it was always a bit difficult. They always said, you know, ah, oh, come on, give me a break. You have no idea what you're talking about. And then we had this uh, um, uh, United for Eritrea uh, activist that approached me. It was like, uh, 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 and it was like a birthday for me. And because I, for the first time, felt that there are people in in the diaspora, uh, young people like me, who feel the same. It was a long uh, fight. Uh, for United for Eritrea in the opposition movement, um, uh, we, we they they thought uh, uh, the opposition movement thought ah you are kids you know okay you could write letters we could do other things uh, that uh, uh, for our parents were more difficult to, to do but still we were all the kids you know when they talked about us they always talked about these the the minors about this more and we always had to say and remind them uh, hey we're adults. I mean, I have a I have a son myself. So it took some years, uh, uh, and today we are at eye level. I'd say we are working together uh, on various different issues, and and uh, the, the, before that, there was uh, communication through opposition radio, or radio arena, etc. And Eritrea, when people uh, had internet access, they uh, uh, secretly listened to that radio on Sundays. Uh, now we have Erizat for a year now. Um, that is a, uh, a TV broadcasting uh, channel from Europe, um, uh, and uh, has reached right down to Eritrea, which is good. Um, it's perfect. It's from a satellite, satellite TV. And many things can be transported into the country now. There's lots of YouTubers uh, that do uh, uh, awareness raising that explain what democracy is. Um, uh, there's news uh, that is broadcast uh, seven uh, eight days a week, 24 hours. You have Erizat now. And that is a super way to communicate with the with Eritrea the because we know from uh, refugees that their siblings listen to it. And also these YouTube, uh, is, uh, is there internet access? No, uh, no, no, but these YouTubers do their news uh, programs, um, 25 minutes or something, and they are then broadcast through Erizat because internet, of course, is very difficult in Eritrea. Uh, let's talk about that generational change. You said you weren't taken seriously. Uh, at the same time, we know from all these opposition groups uh, that have been there for many years um, uh, with the old combatants, etc., and that they remain fragmented um, along, and that they all moved along their old affiliations also uh, uh, along the lines of uh, religious and ethnic affiliations. And now you come and say, uh, Eritrea united. Is that uh, owed to a generational change that uh, young Eritreans are now uh, mobilizing? Is that an opportunity to bring the uh, uh, opposition together and uh, overcome fragmentation? I think yes. We um, quite uh, intently uh, selected United for Eritrea as a name for this. And we had political party representatives that uh, were invited to panel discussion that never, uh, who never communicated to, with one another uh, before. So United means that we want to work together with all uh, uh, people. And uh, we also uh, have talked to uh, a loyal uh, young people, the PFDJ people, uh, will always try to contact them, try to get in contact with them, try to get. Uh, 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 that's unfortunately not possible. Uh, when we posted stuff on Facebook, the only thing that they did was uh, uh, throwing insults at us and uh, libeling and, and not not sitting uh, around a table with us. But anyways, uh, we are seeing ourselves as diplomats. We're trying to get everybody around the table. A last uh, question maybe to you, uh, Wayne. Where do you take the optimism that there is change? We sat in the foreign office today and heard that there is some optimism here. There is some that there may be change. Uh, where do you take that, that optimism from as you and uh, the, the group? Well, I can talk on my behalf. I cannot think of it not happening. 
then I'd uh, think, uh, what have I been doing over the last couple of years? It was all in vain. So my theory is the following. In two years' time, it's over. <laughs> this is a very reasonable approach. Uh, we had three years independence war. Uh, now, 28 years uh, enslaving. Uh, and in two years' time, it's time. We have TV um, uh, reaching Eritrea. There's momentum. Last September, we had a conference with activists from many, many uh, 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 young people from around the world. Uh, that means so much uh, uh, to us. All these people that are, you know, uh, spread, uh, but having them um, starting a project together that signals uh, that something is, is going to happen. And we hope that we all sit in a plane in two years' time and fly to Asmara. Yes, that's, uh, we share this hope. And and maybe a first uh, female prime minister in English. <laughs> of course, that would be just great uh, without doing some name droppings here. Yeah. For Eritrea, I say, um, um, one tends to think uh, that it's men dominating. United for Eritrea is dominated by, by women. There's few may men uh, on board. I have a question. Uh, before I open the floor uh, for comments, questions, etc., um, I would like to uh, come back to what we heard from Zemdena, uh, from her understanding of what Pan-Africanism is. I remain in German, I think, uh, as long as the headsets are on. Um, question uh, to you, what brings you uh, together? in your activism? What role do uh, social media play at the horn of Africa to learn from one another or maybe to learn from one another how to mobilize? And what uh, uh, separates you maybe even? So what are the regional connections? Um, that's what we would like to hear from you. I don't know who this question is addressed to. I, no idea. <laughs> maybe to all. Uh, I think we're at a Pretty interesting time uh, on the continent. Um, a lot of people think about Pan-Africanism. You know, they think it's you know, kill whitey. And that's not what it is, obviously. Uh, political and economic independence within not only African countries but within African blocs is something that's been long overdue. You know. Uh, liberation movements on the continent that moved up against uh, colonialism have been neutralized. You know, they've been neutralized. They've caved in from the inside. You know, very few countries on the continent have led proper liberation movements that have led to a truly independent and economically and politically independent nations. Uh, this has become kind of more uh, the the times. It's almost like we're we're back at that point again where almost you know the neo colonial order is now has been choking uh, African countries for a long time right now. So the question then becomes what is that path to political and economic independence within Sudan and within the region and within on the continent itself? Uh, we're at a point right now where we have phenomenons that we didn't have in the 50s and in the 60s uh, and 70s. Now I can send an instant message to Zamenda, I can send one to Winnie, and I can send one to Ayla, and we can have common understandings uh, across our region and across the continent. Uh, also, the levels of organization themselves. So, you know, governments, we've kind of given up on our governments getting together and trying to create a real ecosystem within Africa that uh, satisfies those basic requirements of political and economic independence. But there is civil society, there's youth, there's arts and culture, there's all of these different uh, aspects of life that can now connect together uh, on the continent. And I really do think that this generation right now uh, that we see, there's a better chance of them to start reaching over the borders and talking to each other. 
uh, you know, with all the social media that's available and everything, uh, the rural problems still remain as rural problems. And that's the biggest challenge. You know, uh, youth from urban centers are probably, you know, within a generation, they can probably be uh, come to understandings of what needs to happen as far as policy and, you know, from the grassroots uh, going up. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's still a long way to go, but I think we're a lot closer uh, right now to a prosperous uh, Africa that would be prosperous for Africa itself, but prosperous for the globe, basically. Thank you. If the others don't want to add at the moment, uh, I, I will look at you. I, thank you for bearing with me and my humble questions here at the beginning. It is time for you to raise your voice and ask questions, comments, and the like. Uh, we have colleagues and uh, we need the microphones for translation, so, yes. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for all of your inspiring stories. Uh, my name is Gerrit Kurtz. I work for the German Council on Foreign Relations here in Berlin. Um, my question is to, to Allah and, and Musab. Um, how represented do you feel um, by the current government, especially the civilian side of uh, the government. Um, and how, what, what's the connection still between uh, the, the women's groups and the, the, uh, the resistance committees and the FFC um, on the, solving the economic crisis um, and the current struggles? Thank you. Thanks. I suggest we collect two or three questions and then... Answer. There's the gentleman here in the front. Can you can you turn the microphone here? Thank you. I möchte Frau Maas. I would like to ask Ms. Maas about the pictures of Avi and Afebeki went around the world after the change in government in Ethiopia. There was a Bundestag discussion, and uh, people. Um, but the hope that the situation in Eritrea would change as well, uh, or similar to Ethiopia. And Abi thanked Afeverki uh, deliberately and openly. So what does this mean for you? Eritrea and then move to Sudan. Um, we, we, we continue. We just give two answers and then we continue. Don't worry, we, we still have lots of time. Um, well, for me personally and also the Eritrean community, um, this change was um, quite um, good um, at the beginning uh, from our point of view. But after four to eight weeks, we have already realized that it's a little bit uh, deceptive, so to speak, that it's... Um, I mean, it's about the friendship between Isis and uh, Abi. It's not about the country or the population. Uh, Abi Ahmed and his country changed a lot. And in Eritrea, nothing changed. Um, Abi Ahmed signed uh, something that uh, provided a signature that should have been provided 16 years ago. In Eritrea, we still do not have the freedom of the press. In Eritrea, we still have the unlimited uh, national service. Uh, what has improved between Ethiopia and Eritrea is that the borders ha were open, that more uh, food could be transported to um, Eritrea, and since then the UNHCR uh, counted approximately 15,000 people who fled um, so for the population in Eritrea, not much has changed. It has all had become worse, basically, in particular for the opposition, which had many offices uh, beforehand and communicate from within these offices. And Avi Ahmed has, over the first months, clearly uh, said that these activists can stay in Ethiopia, but they have to shut down their offices. He will not accept these activists or this activism or the opposition in this country. Uh, whether you feel represented by the by the transitional government. So Allah Mus Musab. Musab? Uh, yes, the 
uh, current government is, you know, I have mixed feelings about this. But in general, um, as far as the core makeup of it, uh, it's satisfying to see people who have been in the opposition for such a long time and has paid a huge price uh, now being in the government. The technocrats that are in the ministries, uh, most of them are uh, pretty thorough. But it's still not a representative government to me until there's a peace deal uh, that happens, until the armed movements, the liberation movements uh, are able to be in Khartoum so that Khartoum becomes a capital for everyone. Uh, and it just seems that if there's no peace deal and we have a truly representative government of everyone in Sudan, that would be you know, an, an, you know, an expression of equality among Sudanese, it's still not uh, representative of, for me, for my aspirations, and I'm sure uh, for a lot of Sudanese as well. Um, uh, but I think that will happen. You know, we have the issue of the economic situation, like you asked. Uh, the problem is it's, it's, it's very complicated in the sense that you're coming out of 30 years of pretty much a war economy uh, and cronyism, a lot of uh, corruption within the government. So the approach has to be a comprehensive approach, even for economic reform. You know, there are rifts right now kind of developing between the resistance committees and between the freedom of forces and change and the civilian government and the military. Uh, the underlying, some one of the underlying reasons for this rift is the, you know, economic situation has not, you know, it didn't make that much progress as much as people thought it would be, but you know, after 30 years of a Bashir government, you know, these economic problems are not going to go away overnight. Uh, but I think you know, there's a conference coming up at the end of March between uh, the forces of freedom and change and uh, the civilian government on trying to find viable economic solutions uh, for Sudan. So you know, for our part as activists and as civil society, we'll be we're very supportive of the process itself of doing a conference and consulting. Uh, but there are some big pieces and there's some heavy lifting that they have to do. And if they don't, then it would be a problem. So come back in April and ask us that question again. And can you say one or two sentences on the, on, are they, do you feel they're equipped to solve the economic crisis that has been severe and in a way also triggered the process, protests? Yes and no. You know, um, the government, the current government, uh, you know, their heart's in the right place. They know that they want to work together. They want to be inclusive and stuff like that. But you cannot do economic reform without a security sector reform in Sudan specifically. You know, coming out of decades of a war economy, a bloated security sector with, you know, economic empires under it. You know, if that's not addressed, then we're definitely going to have problems uh, going forward. So technically they are equipped, but, you know, the courage to actually take that uh, step is yet to be seen. Thank you. Ala, do you feel represented? Bil Hukume. Al Amr Mu'aggat Shoya, Al Hukume, Anna, Fin Rasim Li Rasmin, Shirk Madani, or Shirk Askari. It's a bit complicated. It is a little bit complicated. Uh, I think. There are two parts. One part is the government, and one part is the, uh, the military part, and the other part is the civil society. In the civil section, I think I'm represented, I feel represented. Concerning the military side, I do not feel represented at all, and I have some concerns uh, in this regard, in particular because of the protests in front of the military headquarters when the protests were attacked that brutally. Well, the military as a co 
perpetrator actually would have had the task to protect us in front of the headquarters. So they should have tried to uh, integrate the population in this transitional period or make a um, uh, government out of this, um, out of the population, actually, but this did not happen. Uh, to summarize, there is harmony. We feel listened to when we uh, utter demands or when we march to the respective ministries and we uh, submit our uh, requests. Uh, the minister receives us and takes us seriously. So in three years, of course, we will not be able to uh, get rid of the corruption that has built up over 30 years. And of course, we will support this transitional government until we have reached the threshold of freedom. Now, lots of questions. The gentleman was first, there's a lady here, uh, and then I go zigzagging. Thank you. Maybe we try and stay short because now a lot of questions are popping up. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. My name is Du. In my passport, it says Mujahid. And this is why I would like to ask Musa and Allah. In Sudan, we have huge problems. And our problem is identity. That's the main problem. And today, the new government tries to develop new relationships with the world. My German, unfortunately, is not too good, but I'm trying it nevertheless. Can I say it in Arab? I've been living in Germany for two years, uh, but I'm still learning German. We have a problem in Sudan with identity, and this identity crisis is threatening our peace, the peace in Sudan. One of the activists called Sisma is still in prison while the icon of the revolution is uh, here. And of course, uh, what he meant is that the German federal president is in Khartoum today. And Khartoum tries to uh, build international relations. But we still have problems apart from this. We have an opposition. We have a military opposition, and we've had that opposition for 30 years. And I assume that the transitional period will not create peace together with this military um, opposition. 
reach a peace agreement with this military opposition. So this transition you know, government tries to convince the world as that they are the representatives of the Sudanese. The problem is that in Sudan, we have an identity problem. 95% of the population have African roots. Five. Well, my question is directed at Allah. What is your message? What would you like to say? What is your mission? Yeah. So the question to Musab is, where is Sudan today in this pan-Africanism scale? Well, you might consider me an icon of the revolution, but I see this differently. I s the martyrs are actually the icons of the revolution. I think this should not be directed at me personally. I'm actually a representative for the Sudanese woman. The Jew Sudanese woman is actually the icon of the revolution. This is the way you should uh, look at it um, in this context. A long way to go until it becomes, it comes to a place where it can truly uh, accept the diversity within Sudan. The, the color hierarchy still exists. That's a reality, uh, unfortunately, that we have to face. But it's not a reality that we have to give up on. We can't give up to the old order. The old Sudan is gone. Uh, and to me, I think it's a, just a matter of one generation ahead, we'll have a new Sudan that we really want. Uh, within the peace uh, deal, uh, one thing that can't happen is the peace deal cannot happen only in Juba. It cannot happen only within the hotels of Juba and to do it that way. Uh, there needs to be wider participation to bring peace, true peace, to Sudan. That includes the liberation movements, that includes the civil society, that includes students, that includes women, that includes everyone uh, across the, uh, the board. Uh, but, you know, accountability and justice have to be uh, in the middle of it. And I think the accountability and justice needs everyone in Sudan to work. Um, and that's why documenting all of the uh, atrocities uh, has to happen in order to put the case ahead that, you know, Sudan has been repressed, but people, some people in Sudan have been repressed more than others, you know, as far as the war efforts that we've seen uh, over the decades. Uh, but when it comes to the self, the sense of identity among young Sudanese, uh, I think that's changed drastically. You know, that people started, young people are starting to look at themselves as Sudanese first, and they see themselves in the continent rather than uh, belonging to the Arab center or anything like that. So I'm optimistic about that. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm optimistic about uh, that trajectory. Thank you. There is a question here, and then, as I said, I zigzag. Uh, first of all, good evening, and thank you so much for sharing tonight, for being so inspirational. For me personally, it's a great honor. My name is Amelie, and I work for a Green Member of Parliament here in the German Bundestag. And naturally, as I work for the Parliament, my question would be for German politics. Is there something that you would like the German politicians to do, on the one hand, but also the German civil society to do? And I'm also thinking about... Um, in the case of, of Sudan, 
um, about the UNAMID mission. Is there something you would like to talk, to share about your opinion and the German um, involvement in the mission? Is there anything that, that makes it better, in your opinion, or worse, when it comes to the support that the German government could give to each and one of uh, your efforts in your countries? Thank you. Thank you. I think there was a finger raised here. We're, we're coming to you in a second. So short questions. Lots of people want to ask. Well, I've got a question to Allah and Mossab. In Sudan, we see a dynamic that is not present in Eritrea. So the Arab world, Sudan, is um, part of the Arab world, so to speak. And um, there was the Arab Spring 2011 and 12. And what um, lessons did Sudan um, learn from that so that uh, there was no civil war or uh, a similar situation? And what kind of mechanisms are present or what kind of conditions are there in Sudan so that uh, we don't see a similar situation as in Egypt or Syria. Thank you for that question. Then here we have another question, and then I will go to the right-hand side immediately. Do you have a mic? Co-director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, and I'm thrilled to meet you, Seven Day Man, tonight. Um, I'm just building on the question that you just asked, um, Amelie, because... I mean, Germany is also playing a very critical role, specifically when we look at Sudan and Eritrea. I'm thinking specifically about the support um, to the security sector or the security forces on the border management. So I'm not only what Germany can do better, but also maybe what Germany could just stop doing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Very important. So, so we shift to the other side with the microphone. Is there? Yeah, there's a colleague here. So can you raise your hand so I see you? Um, there's a woman already having the microphone, okay. and then it's you next. My name is Ulrike. My name is Ulrike. I'm just a human being, but I've been traveling to Sudan for many years, and I have personally seen the beginning of the revolution. I was um, in Sudan this year as well, and what I found out is that there is freedom. There can be uh, theater, uh, plays, etc. Uh, you can listen to music, but there's no justice yet. So. My question is whether this um, uh, court proceeding where 25 soldiers uh, got a death sentence is sufficient in order to do justice to the killings of hundreds of people uh, who were well, are killed or raped, etc. I think the whole situation in Sudan is still very fragile, and I don't understand what we in Germany are doing. First, the foreign minister, then Mr. Steinmeier. Well, in Sudan, not much has changed. And um, I know from uh, friends there is that the old rulers are still going to and fro between uh, Sudan and um, Eritrea. And the government is looking away. And the people are traveling with. Um, NISS who are on list and um, with their, their security people and so why should Germany now say well we um, we will support you now and, and uh, everything will be fine in the end um, but what I've understood is that uh, you were talking about justice and also the um, repatriation or um, the deportation of um, asylum seekers, uh, etc. Then the lady in the front, the mic will come back to you. Uh, from Sudan Club. Asi Ahmed, Sudan Club. <clears throat> My question to Allah. Sudanese women have played an excellent role during the revolution. However, uh, participation of women in the transitional government is very low. A uh, question then to Mozab. What's the, the role of the Islamist? The 
There were more questions here. Yes, but you you get your turn. But first, I would like to come back to the panel. We had a lot of uh, questions on Sudan. Uh, can I? From the, from the Arab Revolution, from the Arab Spring, is there is there something? And maybe then Ala can answer the question on 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 women in Sudan, and then we get to the other question. Um, the Arab Spring, yes, it was um, kind of an influence for a lot of young people in Sudan, uh, but it's it wasn't a spark. It wasn't what completely motivated them. Because the people who went out in 2011, they were most likely, they, in their memory, 1985 was still there. You know, the uprising in 1985 that removed uh, Jafar Nimeri was also a civil, nonviolent uh, revolt that ended up removing him. So people who weren't born then, at least their parents and their uncles and everything, and the songs of the revolution from that time and the culture of resistance itself, because they had their parents' generation go through 1985 and their grandparents or their older relatives in 1964. So that seed of dissent and resistance was always there, but it just had to be kind of awakened uh, a little bit. But you know, the Arab Spring, you've had a lot of foreign involvement in the Arab Spring. You know, every country that you look at, uh, maybe with the exception of Egypt, as far as the uh, popular uprising and Tunisia, but as soon as Syria popped up, you know where the foreign interests and what, where that led to. You know, Yemen, Bahrain, all of these different countries have seen uh, foreign involvement, Libya, and we've seen where that went. The Sudanese revolution is 100% organic and homegrown. There hasn't been any, and no one helped us, no one came and gave us a lending hand, no one came and bombed Bashir or anything like that. It was all Ala and her you know, uh, cohorts who went all out uh, and actually removed it. But it comes on the back of a lot of Sudanese struggles, armed and nonviolent. Uh, so it kind of lives in a space by itself, uh, you know. And the fact that there wasn't any foreign involvement means that also that, you know, no one can take credit for saying, yes, we helped you. Uh, you owe us something. We don't owe anyone any, anything. So uh, I think that's the main distinction between what happened in Sudan and uh, the Arab Spring. So well, Allah, these cohorts, the women in the protests, what, what about them in the future? الحاجة اللي كانت محبطة أكثر بعد الدور الكبير اللي قدمته النساء في الثورة أول ما بدأت عملية التفاوض تم إخصائهم. This is wirklich eine Schande. Well, uh, one ignored then the women uh, after the completion of revolution. That's a shame. We tried uh, to use uh, social media um, doing organizing activities there. There was a campaign uh, that was uh, called um, at least 50%. Not just 50%, it was not the quota. Um, but also women should be there at the levers where the decisions are being made. Women are visible all over Sudan. They played the role. They made a contribution everywhere in Sudan. It's 18 ministers, four of uh, who are women. It's not much, but at least it's something. So we're preparing for the elections, and uh, God willing, uh, um, we 
can uh, improve the, the uh, role of the war for women after three years. Let's see. Well, this question of justice, is justice to come about? And then we go to this Germany in and Germany's role. Um, the question of justice is um, very complicated because now you have uh, a you know investigation into the June third massacre, but people are asking about investigations that go to the war in Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile, and then the war in Darfur and the war in the South. So you have, and these are war crimes. These are genocides that have happened that have actually cleaned out people based on ethnicity. So the issue of justice is the question is how far back do you go and what are the mechanisms? Is it truth and reconciliation? Is it, you know, punitive justice or what are the mechanisms uh, of it? I think with the peace deal going on in Juba, it can address those issues, but it needs to be a bigger uh, conversation than that. And it needs to be, it needs to be serious measures so that we know that that's not going to happen, uh, in the future. But, uh, she was talking about the, there are dangerous things that are happening just real quick. I know you said two sentences, but you know. I think this whole justice issue is one for an extra evening. I'm sure it's, yeah. it's, it's very intense and very complex, but there was questions about Germany's role. I would like to expand the question a little bit beyond Sudan and, and maybe, uh, also speak a little bit about in your answers about Ethiopia, possibly Eritrea. Um, so Zimdena, would you like also to answer to this? What is, what, what is Germany's role with the Ethiopian development and uh, what should the Germans not do also in Ethiopia? Yeah, um, nice to meet you too, Nina, in person. Um, yeah, um, for me as a Pan-Africanist, of course, I'm skeptical of foreign intervention, particularly Western intervention, um, considering the history as a we come from as Africans, because our relationship with the West has never been too good. Um, uh, for Ethiopians particularly, we, although we never had like direct uh, impacts of colonialism, we still suffer from neocolonial policies. So obviously we're very careful of who we trade with. Um, for me, Yes, foreign intervention is good um, because we live in a global world. We, it cannot be avoided. But then again, what I would like from the German government and more importantly from the German public is for, first and foremost, not to be embayed with dictators just because it it's supports your own foreign, your own national interests. You know what I mean? Like, yes, for your national interest, if, if you're real Democrats, then that democracy should be extended to other countries. Africans deserve to have democratic leaders. It's not just uh, reserved for the Western world. And I think uh, the West should recognize that because uh, dictatorships are dying Racism is dying. Sexism is dying. I don't think this new generation that's coming is uh, up for, you know, discrimination, injustices. The, the days of injustices are dying. So if, if, if we want to live in a collective and peaceful world, we have to help each other. We have to vision for a world that is full of justice. So uh, also in terms of um, armaments and selling arms, the, the Ger German government is uh, implicated. Uh, and I would ask more than the German government, the German public, to hold your uh, governments accountable on our behalf. You know what I mean? Thank you. So, yeah. I, I, I think Wayne has, has it very clear what the Germans should not do. So maybe very briefly an answer on Eritrea. Um. Eritrea hasn't got a, a elected government. It's a regime, it's a dictatorship. And for me personally, uh, it is horrible uh, that the government uh, sits at the table, uh, that the, they pay them visits. Uh, and two years ago in the Bundestag, there were uh, lengthy discussions about human rights uh, violations in Eritrea. And there's this feeling time and again, if you sit with them at, uh, at a table, that, you, that it just says that they don't take that seriously because uh, the refugee waves are dying and the people uh, rather die on their way towards the West before they grow old in uh, Eritrea. And that should be food for thought. Uh, for the German government and should support more than the opposition movement. Uh, Eritrea wants change and uh, um, frequently you listen 
Uh, you hear that uh, there shouldn't be another Arab Spring that uh, goes uh, wrong. Uh, we don't need an Arab Spring, but we don't need this regime. Explicitly talked about the, the ongoing militarization problem, so I think that gives a clear message also on uh, deportation of, re of, of refugees from Sudan that the German government is, is, also, uh, is also seeking. But what other topics, uh, what other issues you think the Germans should get involved? Uh, I think the first stop for the German government would be completely rethinking the cartoon process, which is the actual process that is used for migration control. Uh, for years, there's been warnings that this Khartoum process that's used to stop migration is propping up militias that are tasked by, you know, with uh, guarding the border. Uh, these warnings have, you know, gone pretty much unnoticed, unanswered. Uh, we met sometimes with denial. But I think now there's a clear idea of why uh, that was, you know, the, the mechanism itself of the Khartoum process was a bad idea, especially with a government like Bashir's government. Uh, Ala talked about the uh, massacre of June 3rd. You know, that's when these RSF forces were basically saying that, you know, okay, we heard the chants that you said, we're all Darfur. If you want to be all Darfur, we're going to bring Darfur to Khartoum, meaning using the same scorched earth tactics that were used in Darfur in Khartoum. So the Khartoum process, we understand that the migration is an issue for Europeans, but migration is first and foremost an issue for us in Africa first. Because the question of what makes a young person move from Eastern Africa, go through Libya, where they might be enslaved, go through the Mediterranean, 250 or 300 people on a small boat, make that perilous journey just to come to Europe. The question then, what is he running away from? What are they running away from that they can put their lives on the line to get there? You know, ask Winnie what they're running away from. Ask us what they're running away from. You know, and have solutions at home so that there's a better environment at home. Uh, and that goes into the second part of what the German government and the EU should be doing. Civilian rule. You know, Winnie talked about how you're dealing with a dictatorship that's been there for decades. Why not have a policy for the region that's emphasizing the idea of civilian rule, that a military person should not be making calls on all aspects of government, not even a small part of the government. Military should be prone to civilian uh, authority. That's a very important point across the whole region. But this way of dealing with these governments as a status quo and just being realistic and saying, well, these governments are there, so let's deal with them, that's what makes the problems worse. A, th a really quick third thing would be uh, neoliberal economics do not work for us on the continent. That's just been proven time and time again. There is no trickle-down economics. There is no business entrepreneurship that's going to lift Africans up. We need a social uh, econom economy. We need an economy that's based around people, that focuses on local production, that focuses on empowering communities. And I think the European model can be a basis, a better basis than us relying on the Arab Gulf or on Trump or on any one of these actors. Thank you all three of you. Um, I think this would be a, a wonderful towards the end, but I promised two more questions. One is the gentleman there and the, sorry, the man with the red t-shirt and then we will go into, and let's be gender uh, sensitive and ask the lady in the back and then I would need to close formally, but we can informally talk to each other further on. Okay. Uh, äh, Im Eingang gefragt, woher hast du diese Zuversicht, dass in Eritrea wirklich... Where is the confidence that something better comes in Eritrea? Da hat uh, uh, Germany uh, given up on Eritrea, forgotten about Eritrea, that the gentleman in the red T-shirt. I have a question for... Uh, we are Eritrean uh, refugees, and in Germany, to be honest, 
who have not a say. And if you uh, live in a refugee camp, uh, people say, uh, hey, you guy from Eritrea, uh, why don't you go home? Uh, and I hear that in Eritrea everything is OK. But everybody wants to like to uh, go home. I don't want to uh, uh, stay in Germany. I hear it on the, on the tube every day, you know, oh, you black man, you uh, be ashamed. Uh, 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 thanks for this very personal statement here. Uh, we have the lady in the back there. Yes, yes, I know there are so many different and more questions here, uh, but uh, I, we have to keep an eye on the watch. Um, um, we have informal uh, uh, opportunities to talk to one another later down there. I, I'll be talking in, in, in English, says the lady. To Zem Dena, um, because you identify as a Pan-Africanist womanist. And um, in the whole struggles, I see women uh, uh, participating a lot. And uh, what the question I'm asking myself now, if I think of Pan-Africanism, um, when Pan-Africanism started, um, there was a lot of global solidarity between Pan-Africanists. And um, in the moment, I don't see that. Like, I can't feel it. I can't see it. So you people are the ones in the field. And I would like to throw this question at you. Um, where do you see the connections? Do you have connections? Or um, where do you see bridges you can build? Not only in the continent, like not just the, the south-south bridges, but the south-north, um, especially with the diasporas. Thank you. Maybe we start with a question we left out uh, on the Islamists in, in Sudan and and then go to Eritrea and um, briefly. There's been a long history, of course, of, you know, using Islam as a weapon, basically, political Islam. Uh, but it's been so for, done for so long that the spell is almost broken now, you know. Uh, the idea of having fatwas and stuff against other Sudanese, you know, the absurdity of that is kind of realized right now. Even the Islamists, as far as organizing inside of Sudan, they've lost their influence even internally among their bodies. You know, whether it's NCP, whether it's PCP, you know, Salafists have always been kind of far from uh, the political sphere. Uh, if anything, it would be more affiliates of the old system, but not ideologically based. It would be based on self-preservation, on their interests, uh, on these things. And I think also because of now the government, unfortunately, with their close relations with Saudi Arabia and with the UAE, that have been kind of the biggest spoilers in Sudan and supporting these militias. But at the same time, there's, they're the ones that fear bodies like the Muslim Brotherhood the most. Uh, Qatar has been kind of cut off. Turkey has been a little bit cut off. And these have been kind of the main supporters of the political Islamists inside of Sudan. So there's almost like death throes right now. They're making moves, but there are moves of someone who's already clinically dead. Uh, but the real issue is the former NCP, former NISS, and the big business interests that are in Sudan. Uh, so it's not, you know, political Islamists with an ideology and moving on that front, it's more kind of the, but, they, but they're there. The deep state, the elements from the deep state are still there, but it's kind of a closed box. We don't know exactly what they're doing, but the Zahf al akhdar which was the protest, it was a failure, you know, and people always recognize this. But the most important thing is that for young people, the days of Kezan will never come back again. No one will accept that uh, anymore. So there's still also work to do, but we're optimistic about that. Thank you. So there was this question on, on Eritrea and why I asked about op 
whether Wayne is still optimistic. Uh, if you ask me, has Germany given up on Eritrea? I can't speak for Germany. I just posed the question because I wanted to see what makes an activist go on and on and on against all odds and against all, you know, bad developments we're seeing. But maybe Wayne wants to speak for herself rather. To this question. Well, on this question, why um, I'm optimistic or why optimism? Well, the fight has been going on for quite a long time. It was the parents' generation that is now retiring. Um, and unfortunately, they um, invested a lot. So it's now high time that the young generation takes over. I mean, there are enough people in the diaspora, enough uh, young people, and also through the Akel movement, you can see that many young people who fled are actually uh, on the move. They are traumatized. Um, it took them a long time. And now five to six years have uh, passed, and now they are um, grounded again, so to speak. And everyone has to make a little contribution. You can't just... Uh, sit down and say, well, the others are going to do it. Um, when every Eritrean in the diaspora only gives 2%, then we will manage to achieve it in two years from now. And to your question, uh, well, it's horrible. We are not at home here. I mean, I was born here. I grew up here, but I'm still not at home here. I hear it time and again. And you, as a young Eritrean who fled, I can tell you that you can take a long from Germany, a lot from Germany, uh, education, training, um, and that's what you should do. And tomorrow, when Eritrea is free, you should go there and be the star and implement it there. Pan-Africanism bridges connections and also to the ones living in the diaspora. We have already questions gesammelt. I mean, we already have uh, collected some questions, and now I would like to listen to the answer. Thank you for that question. Um, actually, Pan-Africanism started outside of Africa, right? It was the African diaspora that started it, the Marcus Garvey with his movement of Back to Africa, uh, the Du Bois, yes. So Pan-Africanism as a movement started outside of Africa, and then it came to Africa, and then... Uh, they had solidarity during the independent movements with the Kwame Nkrumahs, the Haile Selassies and things, right? So right now, yes, there's that disconnect. Um, Pan-Africanism exists in a different form in the continent. But thanks to social media, like there's that, for me, the way I breach that gap is through my social media activism, through movement buildings, through coalitions. Um, and also, like, for example, my feminism was highly influenced by black American women writers like Toni Morrison, Bell Hooks, you know what I mean? Uh, womenism, even the term I use, womenism, was coined by uh, uh, Alice Walker. And a womanist is someone uh, who likes to dance, you know what I mean? So so we, we have that connection with that black American um, uh, feminist of today. So Pan-Africanism has been redefined. It's not the Pan-Africanism of back in the day. So for me, uh, the way I bridge the gap is basically by using social media. And one of my greatest tools is writing. Because my pain is a pain to patriarchy. My, that's my tool. So Pan-Africanism for me has been uh, uh, a movement of the people. It's not just a movement of the African Union. For me, the African Union actually right now is a very useless, and I'm bold enough to say that, very useless, very patriarchal institution. So we've, we, we're unpacking Pan-Africanism as we see fit and in our day-to-day -day lives. And then for me, this is Pan-Africanism, meeting black people in Berlin. That's Pan-Africanism. And forging solidarity, sisterhood is Pan-Africanism. Thank you. Thank you. And... I think this is a brilliant uh, statement to say thank you all for coming a long way, fighting for your visa, uh, obstacles on the way, and, and coming to speak on your own. I think this is what inspired us tonight. It was a bit of a tour de force in a 
going through a region uh, with uh, several countries here at stage, uh, uh, dramatic changes, a lot of uh, challenges and optimism ahead, uh, a, a couple of posts ahead and uh, not decided futures. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, listening in. We will have chances to speak informally. I know there's many other questions that I couldn't uh, take to the floor, um, but we will have uh, snacks and drinks downstairs. And please, uh, please also use the opportunity Sudan Archive, Sudanese Archive brought two films, which are screening in the rooms here on that floor over there and downstairs. You might be interested to watch them on your way out they're still rolling on uh, we're not the Berlinale but we have brought film to you from the region so please enjoy these and the conversations to follow thank you for your uh, interest and thanks again and big uh, 